So for most of you who were here in our last um, part of this panel session, uh, you heard our great panel that came across um, from a diverse area of the country to talk about some of the main topics associated with the, 590, the NRCS 590 Nutrient Management Standard and um, kind of what's going on with what states are doing, um, considerations of those things, um, and uh, kind of what are the next steps. And so this part of the session, we have kind of just have about a 20 minute block here. And what we wanted to do was, one of the questions we asked our panel members as well as all the state resource conservationists from across the country is, in the next five years, because the 590 is kind of revised every five years, in the next five years, what do you see are going to be the major issues that are going to arise? What are your areas of concern? What do you need more information about? What's happening here? And uh, with that, we kind of gathered a list of all those things, and there was a handful that were definitely highlighted and obvious. And um, those were, uh, number one was the phosphorus or phosphorus index, the things related to that. What's going on with this? How can we revise this and make it better? The second was the nitrogen leaching uh, and nitrogen leaching index. So those two things, phosphorus and nitrate, are kind of the big buzzwords right now. Another was air quality assessment and planning and the lack of information there. What do we do? Tools, assessments, etc. Winter application, and this will vary all across the depending on what these are. Oil factor rainfall, as well as snow cows, etc. And then something called match use to to this. But I kind of highlight to show the commands of that. This not to necessarily get a fee for research per se. If you want that ground level, because there's kind of that has it. So things that if I, we need work this ground level where there are kind of maybe more what the plan, what they're middle men to help what they need. Just a question the last session. Uh, maybe your comment question. Is the 90, is there any way to show actually if it practices? There's no. Someone who actually as well searches all sorts and all this can tell you that it's perfect nutrient management plan. Is that producer can it and it? It's complete. So yes, what we do in the with all things is better understanding and education. So it's plan our CS folks, conservation should be directly with those producers because the time I have producer way more valuable than anything the right thing, stand the concepts. If I know what happened in getting a nightly night compound, they're most effective learning rate. Important rate information is also important. Frame a lot of what you're going to see has come from in our street. We're um, challenged with that. Uh, and then, by the way, so what we're going to do at the end of this, so I'm going to go over each one of these. And then the topics that are of interest to you are uh, things you want to create state, regional, and national collaborations with. I want you to put your name on a post it note. And or you can, uh, if you have enough business cards, you can take those up um, under any and all of the subjects that you're, in, um, you're interested in. And what we'll do is we'll pull all that information into an email and send it out for each one of these topics as kind of like a catalyst to start creating good networking and collaborations for some of these topics, whether that's just information sharing, whether that's, hey, let's get a research project going. We all have the same problem in this region, or even if it's, you know, from Washington all the way to New York. Maybe we've got the exact same problem. Let's share your expertise and my expertise. And so this is the way that research projects are building in the future. And so let's actually just get that going. Um, instead of just trying to meet everybody at this conference, this kind of helps a little bit too. Maybe both those things will happen at once. So that's what we're gonna have. We'll give you time at the end to come up and do that. Put your information up there um, as well. So for the phosphorus index, there's a lot um, that came up with phosphorus because this is on everybody's mind right now in NRCS and the folks who are kind of revising these things. Big thing, interpretation and implementation. That actually covers everything else that's on this list for the most part. It's how do we know what's high and what's low with phosphorus? Where do we draw that line? Is it based on soil type? Is it based on regional considerations? What if there's absolutely no water adjacent and there's no tiles. Is phosphorus actually a problem for building up on that soil? Is 200 parts per million, 500 parts per million, 30? What is that threshold value that's gonna be a problem? So understanding that better is really important for these, uh, most states, because they're having to draw those lines right now for, okay, at low, at high, so when you reach this value, that's very high. Now you have to apply at P rates instead of N rates. And if you're applying manure, wow, that really screws up your system because Typically, just the chemistry of manure, if you apply at N rates, you're always about 150% of P. So now you have to supplement with chemical fertilizers, and now what's the cost of that? So we have to be considerate of these practicalities that go with this. 
So it's bringing that science-based information, partnering with those folks who are actually going to use this and trying to figure out what are those thresholds. So that's a really big one right now uh, with regions. There's also, we need better area resolution between and within states. That was said and we heard one of our panel members, Washington, they split their state east and west because the east side gets about 12 inches of rain and the west side can get upwards of 80 in certain areas. So that's, that's a really big difference on what your phosphorus movement concerns are gonna be. So having those regional uh, differentiations in your PNDEX or considerations is very important as well. Uh, what is the no application rate? This kind of goes with that very high. At what point do we say no more phosphorus? Um, that's a really, I'd like to see anyone try to justify drawing that line as a national consideration. That's really hard. That's very regional. It's almost field based. So that is something that definitely needs some consideration and work on, on better guidance for that. Um, and then some, you know, someone asked about, well, does phosphorus leach and how far? And is this a problem with my tile drainage? Can it move two feet? You bet it can in certain soils. That has been shown. So how far are we looking before it's a problem? And is this something that needs to come up? So no one's quite sure about that right now and how to deal with that. And then a really big one is the phosphorus analysis method. So the laboratory methods, Bray, Morgan, um, et cetera. Which one is the best one and where do we use it and how? And this, um, if you talk to folks who do a lot of work with phosphorus testing, they'll tell you they're all garbage. <laughs> and that's not very helpful either. So it's when do we use these tests and what are the best considerations? And they're non-comparable, which makes it very challenging when you're trying to put something into a phosphorus index that says Bray, but all you have is a Morgan test and there's no conversion for the two. So when do we use what and how? And so there needs to be far more consistency and maybe even just, you know, a national, if you, if you have these soil types, use these, or maybe there's someone we just need to get rid of all together. So for those kind of in the soil and chemistry um, and phosphorus field, that's a really important thing that came up from a lot of different states. For the nitrogen leaching index, um, as you heard today, this is new for some states. Some states like Colorado have actually been working on this for a long time. They pioneered the start for a lot of other states. But for the most part, there's few tools. Most are using Russell 2, but again, that doesn't have necessarily regional consideration. And leaching is very soil-based. And so you heard today, there's some states that are trying to implement that piece in here and there, uh, but it's challenging. And as a planner, for being able to go out and assess when soil leaching may occur is very challenging. There isn't a good tool for that quite yet. So development of that would be very good. Um, a lot of states kind of talked about that. Not sure how to evaluate leaching in their planning. Um, and then the need for BMP options for leaching management. So a lot of when you read an NRCS um, standard, which are used for planning, so we all have consistency for the most part, it talks about here's the purpose and here's what it does and um, for here's a little piece about what it does for air quality, et cetera. But for the leaching part, it's not so well defined for a lot of them. And so it'd be good if we had these type of practices lead to leaching events. These type will help prevent it. So it comes to that, and I'm sure you'll hear this a lot this whole week, the four R's of nutrient planning, uh, the kind of the right source, right rate, right timing, right placement. And I think that relates not only to runoff, but leaching events. And so a lot of states are really wanting to kind of incorporate that in for the leaching component. Tell us when it's going to be a problem and that way we can plan accordingly. And this comes to a question that also came up about we need more flexibility for new tools and technologies to kind of float into the 590. And that's where this will come into play. It's having um, kind of these research bodies say here for when we're addressing nitrogen leaching it's, um, these are the practices that are going to help the BMPs for those things. So that's something that needs to be put together and built. And there needs to be more science-based information on when and how leaching occurs in specific soil types. A lot of researchers are probably thinking, what? You've been doing that for years. Well, the, pl the planners don't know this. So the education and the outreach part to the folks who are actually using these tools and talking to farmers and educating farmers isn't there. So that's a, um, a pathway that definitely needs to be built and needs to be kind of bolstered up quite a bit. And then what came up as well, what about nutrient trading? Is this viable? And I know this is a buzzword a lot right now. And, um, is this even a good idea? And I'll leave that as a completely open question. Uh, but the nitrogen leaching comes into that. Um, tile management also comes into that. 
So that's big for what we heard for phosphorus and for nitrogen and for the winter spreading for pathogens and sediment and everything. So tile drainage, that's going to come up more and more and more. You're going to see that in a lot of areas. Air quality assessment and planning. Uh, so this one was um, important for, uh, there just needs to be more guidance there in formatting. So there isn't anything really there yet. There's no assessment tool, there's no format for this. And so there needs to be more evaluation tools for that and training of planners on how to identify air quality, how to um, do those pieces. So that's definitely a big one. And prioritizing pollutants to address, also very important for regional, national considerations. And then air quality versus climate change. Which do we focus on and what? Because they are separate from each other. Winter nutrient application. This is the tile drainage. When do you apply the snow cover to frozen ground? What are the impacts of that? Um, a lot of these are very much um, uh, kind of listed out there. We heard a lot about these. Uh, what restrictions are anticipated in the coming years? How is this going to affect storage? So this will be a big one. Storage issues are going to come up more and more if we tell people you can't apply certain times of the year. So better ways to manage that, lagoons versus tanks, etc. So figuring out unique ways to do that. Alternatives to land application altogether was something that was put up. And then enrolling custom applicators in this process. So they tend to be overlooked and so they don't have the same environmental perspective as farmers may be forced to do with regulations also very important and then the development of better manure application setback distances with more scientific evaluation and consistency and flexibility not just stay 100 feet at all times of the year that's not smart you're going to lose a lot of your productivity and your land base etc you need flexible movable setback distances specific to your area so that's something that needs to help be utilized and implemented in different regions and states and then the last one matching the tool with the user so this came up a lot. So who is using the tool that you are developing through a research project or through some of these? Is it the planner? Is it the producer? Is it both? Who should be using these tools? Keep that in mind, very important. And these need to be far more real time. And we also need revision of a lot of the old tools that are used for planning with better science and kind of update it. So keeping in touch with your state on getting those things done. What's best? Webs? Our web interface, apps, Excel, when is the most appropriate interface to use, which has most utility. And then a definitely a high need to integrate producers and planners into your research and reviewers as, as reviewers and testers. Very important to kind of get that connection made because it's lost and then what gets developed out of these is kind of the missing link. And so that's where, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, being able to share scientific advisors from a regional perspective and being able to say this is a really good pathway to get your research and your results into a usable format, get that integrated to tools and get that information to producers. And so that, uh, the last topic we have here is starting to develop that team. If you're interested in being a collaborator and a participant in that team that we're going to start trying to develop and see where we can get that to go in developing a national template for moving forward with that and or if you're interested in the use of that, um, that's when you definitely want to identify yourself on. And this is something we'll start developing um, in the next kind of few months and see, see what we can do with that. So with that, um, I'm going to spend the last couple minutes we have here um, having you come up and put your name up on these um, and identify those areas that you are interested in participating in. And um, we've got the scotch tape is also up here for your cards. So I think that's it for Teddy Gray. So yeah, it was kind of a quick session. But thank you for coming. It's kind of the wrap up from our earlier session in our panel and for kind of listening to some of the things that need to be done as well. And this will also be available um, in the proceedings. So have those, those lists of items as well. But Definitely kind of come on up and put your names up if you're interested. You can do that now. We'll leave those up through lunch if you're trying to get to another panel and or have one now. Um, and, uh, and you can do that at any time.